Please open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 52, verse number 6. We've got a parallel from 2 Kings chapter 25, beginning at verse number 3. Jeremiah's story says this, On the ninth day of the fourth month, now that would be the end of June in 587 B.C. that we're talking about here. It is the end of the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. So on that day, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. So there's nothing left. They are digging through trash, chewing on bits of leather, trying to find something of nutritional value. And this is exactly as was prophesied would happen. Uh, You remember that Ezekiel uh, went through a period of time where he ate starvation rations Uh, or bare subsistence rations that he was cooking over manure in order to to have something to eat. And uh, his prophetic pantomime was demonstrating that it would be even worse for the people in Jerusalem when the siege was coming to a close. Verse number 7 says, Then a breach was made in the city. So the battering rams finally knock enough blocks apart from one another that the walls begin to cave, allowing for soldiers of Babylon to make their way into the city. And so when they saw that that was happening, all the men of war fled and went out from the city by night by the way of a gate between the two walls by the king's garden while the Chaldeans were around the city. So what happens is there's already a plan for evacuation in mind for the king and his inner circle for his security forces. That the moment that they realize the Babylonians are going to come into the city by force, that in the middle of the night, King Zedekiah is going to be snuck out of a little access point on the eastern side of this of the administrative uh, government complex. We're talking about into the Kidron Valley, somewhere not too far away from the uh, modern southeast corner of the Temple Mount. So somewhere in that little valley area, uh, he's going to sneak out a little access point in the wall. And this was also predicted by the pantomime of the prophet Ezekiel. You'll remember that In the middle of the night, he dug through uh, a portion of a wall and uh, took his things through the hole and escaped into the night. Uh, And uh, later uh, was able to explain that that's what's going to happen with the king, uh, Zedekiah, whenever uh, the Babylonians take the city. Well, here it's actually happening. And so they went in the direction of the Arabah. So the Arabah is the desert region along the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea Valley. So Zedekiah and his guys, they get out on that east side of the city of Jerusalem. They make their way uh, up and over the, uh, the Mount of Olives, and then eventually they drop down into the Jordan Valley, uh, down on the plains of Jericho. But they're not going to get away. Verse 8. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. No doubt they had uh, forces that were dedicated to going around the city under siege to see if there was any evidence of people trying to escape. And so once they saw that, they tracked him down and they caught up with him down near Jericho. And all his army was scattered from him. Uh, As soon as his security forces saw the approaching uh, might of the Babylonian army, they were out of there. They abandoned their king like a bad habit. So they captured the king, and then they brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamat. So Nebuchadnezzar is not actually at the siege of Jerusalem because it was going to take a good long time, 
he remained up at his uh, his administration uh, headquarters in uh, Hamat, uh, the country of Hamat, which uh, Ribla is, a, I was trying to think, is a couple of hundred miles north of Jerusalem, uh, almost to the Euphrates River, but not quite. So once the king is captured, he is taken all the way up there, and uh, he passed sentence on him. And you might remember that there was a prophecy made to Zedekiah that you will go to Babylon, but you will never see it. Do you remember that? Well, here's how that prophecy comes to pass. Verse number 10, the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. They were also in the entourage that was trying to escape. And also slaughtered all the officials of Judah at Riblah. So people that were in this leadership council that was trying to sneak out of the city at the last second, they get captured and they are all killed in front of King Zedekiah. And then, verse 11, he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains, and the king of Babylon took him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. So exactly as was predicted. He sees the king of Babylon face to face. That was prophesied. He sees the deaths of his sons, his heirs. He sees the deaths of his inner council. And then his eyes are burned out of his head. And then he's taken to Babylon. So he goes to Babylon, but he never sees it. And he is kept in custody until he finally dies. Now his brother, Jehoiakim, is in exile up in Babylon. He's kept under some sort of uh, detainment, but he will eventually be released from that detainment. Uh, Not so for King Zedekiah, uh, because Jehoiakim actually surrendered as a young man to the king of Babylon, as he was told to do by the prophecies of Jeremiah. And so one of these guys obeyed God and the other didn't. And so one of them will be released from custody later. At this point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar sends his representative to finish up the punishment of this rebellious city. Uh, And that is recorded uh, the part that I want us to read in 2 Kings 25, starting at verse number 8. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, so Zedekiah's boys are dead by now, and he has been blinded, and he's being transported to Babylon. Uh, So about a month after the siege breaks through the wall, that was in the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. So this guy arrives on the seventh day of the fifth month, which means uh, we're talking about uh, the tail end of July now in 587 BC. And he has been put... Uh, here to carry out the task of dismantling whatever is of value at Jerusalem and taking it away and burning all the rest, destroying all the rest. So verse number nine says that he burned the house of he who is and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. Let's leave the king's passage and go back to Jeremiah, because I want to talk to you a little bit about the dating. Uh, We know that the servant arrived on the seventh day, 
in Jeremiah 52, verse 12, it says, in the fifth month, on the 10th day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard who served the king of Babylon, had entered Jerusalem, and he burned the house of he who is, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. So we've got a couple of different dates here. We've got an arrival date, the 7th, and the burning date, which is the 10th. Now, we have complications here thanks to rabbinical traditions that have incorrectly identified the day of Jerusalem's destruction as the ninth day of this fifth month, the ninth day of the month Ab. And uh, I have no qualms in saying that those rabbis are wrong. I don't know how they came to select the ninth day of the fifth month as the day that the burning happened, but Josephus himself, in his Wars of the Jews, book number six, when talking about the day of the destruction of the temple he knew in A.D. 70, and he was an eyewitness, so he knew exactly what day of the calendar it was. This is what he says. Uh, This is uh, subsection uh, 249 in book number six. So Titus, that's the future emperor, retired into the Tower of Antonia, that's the palace fortress complex to the northwest corner of the temple of the first century, and he resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp round about the holy house. But as for that house, God for certain long ago doomed it to the fire. And now the fatal day was come, according to the revolution of ages. It was the tenth day of the month Luz, or Ab, upon which it was formerly burnt by the king of Babylon. And although these flames took their rise from the Jews themselves and was occasioned by them, for upon Titus's returning or retiring, the seditious lay still for a little while and then attacked the Romans again. And then those that guarded the holy house fought with those that quenched the fire that was burning in the inner court of the temple. But these Romans put the Jews to flight and proceeded as far as the holy house itself, at which time one of the soldiers, without staying for any orders, without any concern or dread upon him, of such great an undertaking, being harried uh, by the certain divine fury, snatched somewhat of the materials that were in the fire, and being lifted up by another soldier, he set fire to a golden window through which there was a passage to the rooms that were around about the holy house on the north side of it. And as the flames went upward, the Jews made a clamor, such as has so mighty affliction re- uh, required, and ran together to prevent it, and now they spared not their lives any longer, nor suffered anything to restrain their force, since the holy house was perishing, for whose sake it was that they kept such a guard about it. So Josephus says, the fire that burnt down the temple shrine building started on the tenth day of the fifth month of the Jewish year. Just like, he says, the fire that burned down the temple, the first temple, started on the 10th day of the fifth month of the Jewish year. And that's exactly what it says in Jeremiah 52 as well. So this idea that the 9th of Ab is the anniversary of the burning of the temple is just flat out wrong. It contradicts inspired scripture. It contradicts older historical documents than the rabbinical documents that list the ninth day as the day. Now, why am I making a big deal out of that? It's one of the reasons why I don't trust the rabbinical literature for historical information, because it is often proved to be wrong. So I don't recommend that you go to it as a historical source or even as a traditional source, because we know it's often wrong in that as well. 
All right, so let's get back to the Jeremiah uh, passage, which starts describing what happens next as the temple is burned down and this commander, this representative of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, is carrying out his master's orders regarding the rebellious city of Jerusalem. And keep in mind, God is the ultimate one that's causing all this to happen because of the sins over generations and decades and centuries of the Judean kingdom. So verse number 14 of Jeremiah 52. All the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. So they burn all the flammable houses or portions of the houses that were flammable in the city of Jerusalem. And then they tear down the exterior wall of protection. Verse number uh, 15, I believe, is where we want to go next. And Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, carried away captive some of the poorest of the people and the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon together with the rest of the artisans. Now, that is a process that takes time. It didn't just all happen on one day. Uh, We know from other passages that the people who surrendered and the people who were captured alive were taken to the city of Ramah, a few miles north of the city of Jerusalem. And that became their internment camp. That became their temporary uh, quarters until they were processed and prepared for transport to Ribla, where King Nebuchadnezzar has his administrative headquarters right now. Uh, And then some of them will be killed because their rebellion, uh, their fighting against the Babylonians is considered to be treasonous, while others who cooperated by surrendering or others who were non-combatants that were captured or even rescued, uh, they will be processed for relocation somewhere in the Babylonian Empire. So they will be part of the exiled group. And then there will be a small number that they will leave in the country of, the, of Judea to work the land to um, pay the Babylonians with the produce of the land. Uh, chapter 52 of Jeremiah, verse 17, or 16. Uh, but Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Then we start talking about his dismantling of the useful material. The pillars of bronze that were in the house of he who is, and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of he who is, The Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all the bronze to Babylon. So way back at the time of Solomon, he had experts in forming bronze make these two great bronze pillars at the front of the temple shrine building. Uh, These pillars stood under the great big tall tower at the front of the temple building. Those pillars were called Yaquin and Boaz. Their names form a sentence in Hebrew. He shall establish in strength. And it was between these pillars that the kings of Israel took their oaths of office. Well, those pillars are now being cut up into pieces Uh, to be sent to Babylon where they will be then repurposed. Uh, The water stands and the great big bronze basin, uh, the great big bronze sea, the water tank that was uh, used around the shrine building, 
those are being cut up uh, and transported in smaller pieces uh, back to Babylon, where they will be probably melted down and used for whatever it is uh, that the Babylonians want them. Now, you might wonder, well, what about the what about those full-sized bronze bulls that the water tank used to sit on the top of? Those disappeared a long time ago. Uh, those were actually uh, taken uh, during the time of the Assyrians. Uh, verse number 18, they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the basins and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service. Also the small bowls and the fire pans and the basins and the pots and the lampstands and the dishes for incense and the bowls for drink offerings. Uh, so these things were used in temple worship, temple services. Well, the temple is going to be totally torn down. It's going to be gone. It's going to be erased. So these things have no purpose at Jerusalem anymore. And so they're going to be taken away as well. Uh, what was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver as silver. As for the two pillars, the one stand, the 12 bronze bulls that were under the sea and the stands which Solomon had made for the house of he who is the bronze things of all these things that was beyond weight. Now, as I already said, the bronze bulls had already disappeared, uh, but their weight was known. That was all in the records. And so that all gets entered into the records of things removed or accounted for by the Babylonians. As for the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits, uh, its circumference was 12 cubits, its thickness was four fingers, and it was hollow. Uh, it had a capital of bronze, the height of one capital was five cubits. We talked about the sizes of all these things way back when we were talking about the building of the temple. Uh, and so what happens is before they're cut up, before they're removed, they're measured and uh, accounted for against probably Jewish records to make sure that everything is there. 2 Kings 25-22 next, which uh, 2 Kings 25 goes through a lot of the things we were just talking about until finally uh, we get down to... Um, to this account in verse number 22. Over all the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, governor. So as he is resolving this rebellious city, this rebellious country, uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar, or his representative, Nebuzaradan, takes one Israeli person, one Jewish person who has capability, who seems to be willing to cooperate with the Jews, and declares that he's going to be the new Babylonian governor of the Jewish region and over all of the Jews that are going to remain in place. So, Gedaliah is a new name for us to know well. Jeremiah chapter 39 now. Jeremiah chapter 39, verse number 11. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard. So this is instruction given by King Nebuchadnezzar to Nebuzaradan before he heads south to Jerusalem. And he's going to carry it out in the fifth month as he's taking things apart and burning the city down to the ground. Here's his instruction, verse 12. It's the instruction about how to deal with Jeremiah the prophet because Nebuchadnezzar knows about Jeremiah the prophet. He's had reports about him, and he knows that Jeremiah has been working for 40 years trying to tell the people that when the Babylonians come, you need to surrender. So from Nebuchadnezzar's viewpoint, 
Jeremiah is a good guy. He is a true prophet because he predicted that this would all happen. So he wants him tracked down and treated well. So verse 12, take him, look after him well, do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. So Nebuzaradan's uh, order is once you find Jeremiah the prophet, you make sure he's good and healthy and safe and secure, and then whatever he wants to do, you help him get it done. Verse 13. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Rabsharis, uh, these are military titles in some of them, Negar saw Ezer, the Rabmag, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon. They sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. So now they've got control of the city. They've got control of the palace. They also have control of the prison where Jeremiah is located. And so they find him among the prisoners, and uh, they took him out. And then they did this. Verse 14 continues. They entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, that he should take him home so that he lived among the people. So they rescue him, and they put him in the custody of the new governor of the Jewish people under Babylonian control. And uh, the next part of the story is how uh, Jeremiah kind of travels uh, in this process with Gedaliah up to Ramah, which is kind of the the encampment where all of the people taken out of the city of Jerusalem are being sorted through. It's the it's the administrative encampment nearest Jerusalem. So tomorrow we'll talk about Jeremiah at Ramah.